Oh, eggs up, girl. You guys look great. Uh, I, I do live in Nashville, but I um, I lived in the Memphis area for about six years. I, when I went full-time at comedy, I moved back to Nashville, which is where I'm from. So I was telling people recently, like this week, that I'm coming to do a show in Memphis, and everyone was like, be careful. I, I was like, I don't think you know where in Memphis I'm going. <laughs> This is like the safest place in Memphis I've ever been. I, like, I, I, I love you all. <laughs> yeah, this is, I'm, I feel like I'm home. Like, we all look like after this we could go to Panera and have a great time. We, like, this is a fun area. So, I, um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about me just, uh, you know, um, just so that we, it's less weird that a stranger is talking to you. Uh, I, 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 my, I love comedy and I hate racism. Thank you. I'm telling myself you're applauding the fact that I hate racism. Like I'm like, but we are at a comedy show. Maybe we're all just really into comedy. I don't know. But I, I did. I say that. But I did hear a racial slur that I'd never heard before. And as white men in the South, we can relate. That doesn't happen that often. People feel very comfortable telling us them. This guy bumps into me. He's like, Psh, whatever, Taco Bell. I was like. Bro, I'm Italian, it's Papa John's to you, okay? <laughs> I'm glad we're laughing. It's been a rough week, I'll be honest. Because uh, here's, I've concluded this. I, uh, I'm a Christian myself, but th thank you. For, I don't know if you're applauding for that or just... That was a real... I don't think she was applauding me for my faith. I think it was... I think you came back from the bathroom and she's like, I thought it was going to be way longer. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, okay. So I'm a Christian, but I think I'm done dating Christian women. I think I've, I've had enough. Uh, I think, uh, 40, can you relate? Like, did you get to the point where you were just done with a she a Christian? Like, oh, okay. Yeah, cool. Okay. So that worked out. For, look, all I'm saying is the last Christian I dated, she broke up with me and this is how she broke up with me. She said, it's God's will for us not to be together. <laughs> you all, she literally wholly ghosted me. Okay. <laughs> now I, I I don't want you to think I'm too bad with the ladies. Sometimes it does work out for me. Not too long ago, I asked a woman out on a date. I said, hey, we should go on a date sometime. She said, sure, where should we go? And I said, I don't know. I've never made it to this point in the conversation before. <laughs> where? <laughs> now, I realize I've give, I maybe confused some of y'all in the back when I said that my girlfriend broke up with me. I've heard my voice. I know. I sound like every black comedian when they're impersonating a white person, all right? <laughs> I've never met my biological father, but if I had to guess, I'd say John Lovitz. What do you guys think? <laughs> Some people even just assume I'm gay. It's, 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 I took a stand-up comedian quiz recently. It's which comic, or which stand-up comedian are you? And I was hoping for one of my favorites. You know, Jim Gaffigan, Jerry Seinfeld, John Mulaney. I got Ellen DeGeneres, so. <laughs> And this is a thing that happens uh, relatively frequently in my life. I have conversations with people where like, they think I'm gay and I think I'm straight and gets very confusing. <laughs> so like, I'll give you guys some inside baseball for stand-up comedy. Like, If you're ever a, a comedian, you might start hosting at a comedy club and your dream when you're hosting at a comedy club is that the headliner is so enamored with you that they're like, hey, come on the road with me, come on tour, we'd love to have you. Uh, that's like more work. You're working with a bigger name. You're getting out there. It's a good thing. Like it's, and you all, a few weeks ago, that almost happened. Well, let me tell you what. Okay, first of all, this comedian, she was like 4,000 years old. She was like ancient. She was an old, it looked like she was going to die after the comedy show. Like I wasn't so sure. But what that means is there was a bit of a language barrier sometimes. When we, there was already a little confusion. Also, spoiler alert, she thought I was gay, just like you did five minutes ago. <laughs> So after the show, she's coming up to me. She's so enamored with me. She's like asking for my business card, asking if I want to go on tour with her. And I should start picking up on things at this point. Because one thing she says is like, more people need to hear from people like you and your perspective. Which is a straight white male. I'm like, yeah, more people do need to hear from me. We're, we don't get to talk enough, honestly. <laughs> And then eggs up, she said something that I had never heard before in my entire life, right? So she looked at me and she asked me this question. And I'm going to ask you guys if you know what it means. She said, are you part of the family? Has anyone ever heard that phrase before? I'll educate you. It's okay. So back in the 1400s or whenever she was from, <laughs> you couldn't openly talk about your sexuality. So if you were gay and you wanted to figure out if someone else is gay, you would ask them, are you part of the family? And if they said yes, then you knew you could openly talk about it. But when she asked if I was part of the family, I thought she meant, 
like, are you Italian? <laughs> you know, because like when you're here, your family, that's our thing, right? So I said, yes. And she's never been more interested in me. <laughs> and uh, I knew at that moment what was going on. I was like, oh my goodness, I want to go, I want to perform with her. But like, if I tell her the truth that I'm not gay, Anyway, we're going on tour next week, and I'm gonna need you guys to not tell anyone <laughs> what's going on. So uh, before I was a stand-up comedian, I was a youth pastor for 15 years. <laughs> that's, like, that's, the, that's the correct response. That's, it is weird when people tell you they used to be a youth pastor. That is like, when you're a youth pastor, people are like, good for you. When you're not a youth pastor anymore, they're like, yep, you're right. What'd you do? Let me go ahead and answer the two questions you are all wondering. Yes, I still believe in God. And no, I didn't do that. <laughs> now we're all on the same page. <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was a youth pastor uh, and I, I, I left to do stand-up comedy, which is like, um, it's almost weirder. <laughs> like people are like, the other one made more sense. Like, <laughs> but um, so the, what I've learned though now as a not pastor, but still Christian, is I have some very controversial Christian opinions in the Christian community. And I'm gonna share with you all my most controversial opinion. I believe with all my heart and everything that I am, that Chick-fil-A is just okay. Yeah, back row gets it. They're clapping, they're loading their guns. It's a beautiful moment of controversy right now. Listen, have you ever noticed how much Christians brag about going to Chick-fil-A? It's like a merit of holiness. Like, I went to Chick-fil-A four times last week. As if I'm supposed to be like, wow, you must have wrote the Bible. You are so holy. Meanwhile, it does not work the other way around. I can't be like, yeah, well, I went to McDonald's four times last week. They're like, we can tell. <laughs> and you should stop. <laughs> All I'm saying is like, their chicken's good, but they, it's, they, they, they pump it up too much. All they do is sell chicken and they make so much money off of it. And I just don't think that's right. Like, you don't know this about me, but I make really good mac and cheese, right? But I know my value. Like, I'm not gonna go open up a mac and cheese place called Living Velveeta Loca. <laughs> And then have the audacity to tell you I'm serving the Lord's noodles. <laughs> no, you know what restaurant I love? The one that like, is honest to a fault. They should get more credit than they do. My favorite restaurant, Little Caesars Pizza. <laughs> and it, never as big of applause as Chick-fil-A. I, I, I know that. I know my audience. I know where it eggs up grill. But I love Little Caesars Pizza. Their motto, hot and ready. Good's not even part of it. <laughs> They don't care. <laughs> you can't complain at a Little Caesars. It's impossible. You would show up there and there's always like a high schooler working the cash register and you'd show up to a little high school boy and be like, excuse me, uh, this is just a cardboard box with pizza sauce on it. And the cashier would be like, and? It is warm and in your hands. We've done our job. I kind of consider myself the Little Caesars of comedy. I'll take that title. Instead of hot and ready, you all could call me hot and sweaty. Some of you might even be like, he's not even that good. How much did you pay? I showed up. <laughs> that joke does so much better when it's a free show. <laughs> you guys are, we actually paid to be here. So step it up, buddy. Of course, everyone's favorite part about Little Caesars is their crazy bread, you know, with the garlic and parmesan topping. You got, yes, you nodded so into that. You were, we, we're like the same person now. Uh, I love it. But hey, here's, here's a fun fact for you. Uh, the, Little Caesars, they have a secret menu. Uh, and on the, oh man, you got, you're booked up now. The, I got both of them now. Um, so on their menu, there's actually an option you can get where you can get that garlic and parmesan topping on any pizza you want. So good. Only challenge is it's called a heart attack. So like not too long ago, I went in there. And I was like, yeah, I'd like a pepperoni pizza with a heart attack, please. And she just looked me up and down. And she's like, you'll get there. <laughs> so I mentioned I was a youth pastor. What I didn't tell you was I started out as a youth pastor when I was 19 years old. I know I was a 19 year old youth pastor. That is too young. Like the kids would come up and ask me God questions. And I'd be like, that's a great question. Let me go call my youth pastor. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But what that means is from 19 to 35, I was doing youth pastoring. That is a long time, 
But that is also during your most like formative make life mistakes years, right? When you were 19, when you were 20, when you were 21, you might've been in college, you might've been into some wild living, you might've been doing some drugs, going some gloves, getting with some ladies and men, or ladies and men, I don't know. Like you, but those are the years that people do that kind of stuff, not me, because I was too busy telling teenagers, don't do any of that. But a couple years ago, I went full-time comedy, and for the first time in my adult life, I was able to experience some of that wild living everyone's been talking about. And I'll tell you guys, a few weeks ago, I did one of the most wild things I've ever done in my entire life, and I'm here to report about it. I went to Hooters for the first time. <laughs> oh my gosh, I gotta say, I'm a fan. <laughs> I did not realize that young, attractive women not wearing much clothing, handing me chicken wings, checked off all kinds of boxes I never knew I had. Okay, I feel some of you at Eggs Up are judging me for saying I like Hooters, but what you need to understand is that I am a single 36-year-old man that lives in his mom's basement. I'm literally Hooters demographic, okay? When I don't like it, they complain to corporate. Hey, clap or cheer if you're a, a single middle-aged man. Let me hear ya. <laughs> they're probably not here, but if there are two, they're not clapping. That's what I, like, we don't clap. Look, here, so I'll educate you guys on single middle-aged men. Our whole life goal, if you stay single by the time you're 30 and up, everything about your life, every single day, your biggest worry is, I just don't wanna be that creepy guy. Like that's it, like we just don't wanna be creepy. So when I went to Hooters for the first time, I was like, is this the gateway drug to becoming creepy? Is this how it starts? Dudes just show up to Hooters by themselves? <laughs> She's like, yep. <laughs> well, good to know. <laughs> it's weird which of my jokes people agree with. <laughs> like, yeah, we see that. But here's the thing, when I went, I learned much to my like pleasure, I was not the creepiest guy at Hooters, all right? <laughs> At worst, I was top three. I was number three. At worst, I was three. Second place goes to this dude who's like a few tables over. I sit down and he just starts a conversation. He's like, hey man, you uh, come here often? <laughs> Look, I don't know much about Hooters protocol. All I'm saying is don't talk to the other dudes at Hooters. Let's keep this relationship professional, all right? <laughs> and I was like, that's the creepiest guy until I met this other dude. He walks in. He looks at the hostess. He's like, is Stacy working tonight? <laughs> it's okay, I'm her youth pastor. <laughs> it's a cheap joke. All I'm saying is this. If you're the kind of guy that walks into Hooters and asks for a waitress specifically by name, you're closer to your Netflix special than I am. <laughs> I talk a lot about food when I do jokes. I, it might surprise you guys, but I actually really enjoy to eat. I love it, I love eating. Uh, you don't have to look as not surprised when I say that. Uh, your faces could use some work. Uh, here's something else that could use some work. I get that I'm getting fatter, but the way people tell me that sometimes is really hurtful, all right? So a few weeks ago I was bowling, and this I don't wanna brag about my social life too much, so I don't want you to think I'm better than you, but I was bowling, um, and this middle school girl two lanes over yells at me, she's like, hey, you have the body type of a professional bowler. <laughs> so I went home and changed my Tinder dating profile to body type athletic. <laughs> Does anyone, uh, did anyone, okay. I struck out the first time I asked, tried to get to know the crowd. Are there any single people here? <laughs> Are you, <laughs> Does she know it? <laughs> Is this how you're breaking up with her? I would love that so much. I mean, not for you, but for the rest of us. Remember that comedy show where the guy felt so comfortable that the comedian was gay that he broke up with his girlfriend on... <laughs> okay. Well, this is usually the part where there's at least one single person in this room of married, happy people. And then I ask them, did you do online dating? And they say, sure. And I said, did you, were you brave enough to do it during COVID? In which, in which case they usually like, no, I'm not a psychopath. I'm like, okay, well, let me tell you about my online dating story during COVID. So that's where we're at now. Um, <laughs> 
During COVID, I got a little bored, so I jumped back up on the apps. I started communicating with some of these wonderful ladies that were dating as well. And uh, at one point, I asked this woman, I was like, hey, how's it going? She said, not great. I have COVID. It's all via text. So I waited a few days, and I texted her again. I said, hey, how you feeling? And I never heard from her. So uh, one of two things. Uh, either she ghosted me, or she is a ghost, is all I'm saying. Or she's here with us tonight, <laughs> enjoying the show. I, uh, I do like to usually look around this room and take note of all the wonderful people. Uh, I'm saying, you know, happy birthday. We have a, also a, a later birthday or an earlier birthday, but glad you guys are here celebrating it. I also see a lot of beautiful women here, so let's give it up for all the ladies that are coming to the comedy shows. <laughs> I always do that for two reasons. Number one, 80% of ticket sales are the women, so I'm glad you are here. And also, like the other 20% are probably with, from guys trying to get with the women. So you're kind of a, you're kind of carrying us, ladies, on in the comedy front. But I also have learned myself well enough to know that I need to tell all of you women here, I am not a creepy person. And I know that's usually the first sign that someone's creepy is when they say, "I'm not creepy." I get that, but I've just learned me enough, right? Like I've learned I have nothing but good intentions, but a problem that I'm working on in my life is I frequently say the weirdest, dumbest thing in front of like women, honestly. It's, you have nothing to fear, dudes. Like I'm, we can bro out all day. See, that's one of my problems. Like no one says broing out to dudes. But not too long ago, I was doing a comedy show. It was actually here in Memphis. We were at a dive bar. It was, uh, it, okay, it was not as nice as Eggs Up, I'll tell you that much. Uh, but it was super sketchy, but it was a full house, not a seat to be found. So I'm waiting in the back to perform, and this beautiful woman comes over, and she places her drink at the table, and she looks at me, and she says, hey, can I leave my drink here? Now, what I should have said was, sure, no problem. But like I said, it was a sketchy dive bar, and I wanted her to feel super safe. So I looked her in the eyes, and I said, yeah, I won't drug it. <laughs> So she picked her drink up and went to a different table. <laughs> and I wish like I'd say like, but that was back when I lived in Memphis. Since I've moved, I'm so much better. But a few weeks ago, <laughs> I was doing another show at another sold out place. I was in the back of the room and here's the situation. The table kind of to my left was these like three elderly women. And what I noticed most about the table is they ordered all the best looking food. Like, you guys already know me. I love food. I've already taken note of what everyone's ordered since I've been up here. I just, I'm, you, some people are a picture, people watcher. I'm a food watcher. I just enjoy watching what you eat. It's weird, yes. And usually I don't comment on it, but they had like all the best stuff. And I could not focus on the comedy show because I was just watching what these three old women were eating the entire night. And it was my turn to perform. So I get on stage. And okay, maybe I should have just not said anything. But the first thing I said to these poor elderly women at the comedy show was like, hey, I've been lusting over your table all night. <laughs> Wrong statement. I already know the answer to this question because it's usually single middle-aged men that get most into this next part, but do we have any fans of the fantastic movie series The Fast and the Furious here? Yeah, yeah, I love it. Awesome. I love. That's actually why I started doing comedy was so I could come up to a group of strangers and just start talking about the Fast and Furious. I love it. I'm every time there's a new movie, I marathon it. I get crazy. Like it started when there was just three. Now there's ten. I have to ask time off of work. It's, it's a whole thing. It's a holiday. I'm gonna make it a national. We're gonna do it. Let's make it a national holiday. Furious weekend. I love it. I get oddly defensive over Fast and Furious. I shouldn't, but I do. Not too long ago, I was talking to a friend about it. He's like, I don't know, man. They should have ended after six. And I was like, I think you should have ended after six. <laughs> I know. Where did that come from? I've uh, ruined dates because of Fast and Furious before. I know the most shocking part of that statement was when I said, I've been on dates. <laughs> this woman one time, she said, well, what kind of movies do you like? And I was like, well, I didn't think there was a second date anyway, so I'll answer this question. <laughs> So I told her, love the Fast and Furious. And she, her face visually distorted with disgust. She was like, that is so dumb. Those movies are ridiculous and so unbelievable. I could never watch such an unbelievable, stupid movie. And I was like, okay. It's like, what do you watch? And then this lady was like, romantic comedies. 
Okay. Are you really gonna sit here eggs up and tell me that romantic comedies are more realistic than the Fast and Furious? You're all like, yes, yes we will. <laughs> and I get that because, okay, in my movie, I'll, I'll admit, there is a scene where like The Rock at one point punches a torpedo and redirects it, saving an entire city. <laughs> a little unrealistic. But let me pose this question to you all. Do you know what every sequel to every romantic comedy would be? It'd be your beautiful couple getting a divorce, just like 80% of America, because true love doesn't stick. <laughs> that got dark. All I'm saying is like, the sequel to Love Actually would be like, Love Actually Stinks, don't do it. <laughs> but if you go to your phone right now and you look up The Rock's TikTok and you watch his workout routine for every day, all I'm saying is it's kind of conceivable that his punch could redirect a torpedo. <laughs> I messed up that joke one time, sir, and I said, it's kind of conceivable that his punch could redirect a tornado. And the best part was, it didn't mess with the joke because I was talking about Fast and Furious. They were like, that sounds like Eleven. That sounds like the next movie. They're going to do that. That believe it. <laughs> my favorite thing about my Fast and Furious jokes, and then I'll move on to another topic. Because I can tell this is not your favorite jokes of the night. Obviously, none of you will be tuning into the podcast I started on Wednesday about the Fast and Furious. <laughs> so, the way the comedy process is, before we come into rooms full of wonderful people like you all, we, uh, we test our jokes out on open mics, right? And so sometimes you go to an open mic and there's no audience. Sometimes you go to an open mic and it's a pretty cool room. Sometimes you have brand new comedians doing open mics. And sometimes you have really seasoned veterans like on the road all the time, but then they're coming back to work on their new stuff. So, when I first started my Fast and Furious jokes, uh, that was about maybe two or three minutes of Fast and Furious jokes. I had about 10, so we've really whittled it down to the winners. But I was at an open mic working on my Fast and Furious stuff, and I had a very famous comedian who performed right before me. It was a really cool moment, because we were like crossing the stages at the same time. And he looked at me, and I could tell this was his moment where he was like, inspiring the next generation. And he looks at me, he's like, hey man, just go out there and be yourself. Tell them your piece, let them fall in love with the awesome person you are, and just have fun. So I get on stage and I do 10 minutes of Fast and Furious material. And I'm pretty sure that comedian has never said that to anyone ever again. <laughs> it's really funny to me. I, um, I'll tell you guys maybe the most unique thing about me. Uh, I was born without a sense of smell. It's kind of weird. I don't know if you know many other people that can't smell. Um, you know what stinks about not smelling? <sighs> Nothing. Y'all, that was my first joke 12 years ago that I wrote. And I like to keep it in my set just so you can see how much better I've gotten, all right? <laughs> I, uh, but the, the, the thing is, I like to use my platform to kind of prepare people. Uh, the dumbest question I get asked, and never ask this as someone who you, who you know who doesn't have a sense of smell. This is the question I get frequently. They're like, hey, what's it smell like not to smell? And I'm always like, disappointment, thank you. <laughs> And then when I was a kid, uh, people used to tell me, like, they were like, hey man, at least you didn't lose a sense that matters. Like, at least you're not blind. And like, I get what they're saying now, but as a kid, I used to be like, I wish. I know. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get everyone back in a second here. <laughs> but this is, my, this is my reasoning. I was like, blind people get everything. They're like the divas of the handicapped community. They get sunglasses and canes they can wear everywhere. They get their own language, braille, you've heard of it. Most importantly, blind people get seen eye dogs. Where's my smelling nose dog? <laughs> Give me a retired, retired canine unit, all I'm saying. I have milk in my refrigerator and I don't know how bad it is. Most importantly, this is something you've never thought about until now. You know what you can call a blind person. You can call them blind, because they don't see. Does anyone know what you call someone who's born without a sense of smell? The technical condition is called anosmia. But when I tell you that, you're not sorry I can't smell. You're sorry that 10 minutes ago I had to go look that up before coming. <laughs> So when I was a kid, I used to want people to feel sorry for me, so I made up a word. I said, I, instead of saying I have anosmia, I just shortened it. I said, I'm anosmic, which sounds like an eating disorder. <laughs> people were like, is that the eating disorder where you eat too much, but you never throw up because you look like you have that one? <laughs> That's not funny because you're like, it could be true. Let's not <laughs> trigger him. <laughs> so several years ago, 
a person reached out to me on YouTube. Uh, they said, hey man, we've been seeing your not smelling jokes and, and, and we are part of the National Anosmia Awareness Community. And we'd like to feature them in our next conference. And I said, oh my gosh, that is so amazing. I'll do you one better. Instead of using my videos, why don't I come to the conference and I'll do the jokes in person? And they said, we just want the video. <laughs> I did, I came back, uh, I moved to Memphis because I was pursuing back, going back to college. I went back to college as a medium adult, and that is a weird thing to do when you're a medium-aged adult. Uh, when you're like 18, 19, 20, and you go to college, people are like, good for you, you're gonna do great things. When you're like 90, they're like, why, you have 20 seconds left, just wrap it up. But at college, people, like at 26, they didn't know what to say to me. They were like, I'd say like, I told ladies at church, like, yeah, I'm going back to, uh, I'm going back to college, and they said, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> now I don't know um, how many of you go to church. But in a room this size, some of you probably are in situations where you go to church but you don't want to. And if that's you, I have a fun game you can play. It's called Inappropriate Things Old Women Say at Church. <laughs> you go there and you just track the weird things old women feel comfortable telling you as they pinch your cheek or grab your belt loop. And here's my best one, not too long ago. Uh, several years ago, actually. Uh, this woman, not that that mattered. The time frame doesn't matter for this joke, but I just didn't want you to think I was lying to you. I'm building trust is what I'm doing. So this, 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 uh, this woman, she comes to me at church. She says, hey, Drew, I've been noticing you've been doing all this stand-up comedy, like going around telling jokes. What's all that about? And so I told her, I was like, I love making people laugh. I don't know, maybe one day it'll become a real job. And she says, well, just remember, if you're not getting paid for it, it's not a real job. <coughs> And I was like, aren't you a stay-at-home mom? <laughs> the men are like, oh, the women didn't like that. We have to act. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I am son and it's time for you to move out. <laughs> That's how I ended up in Memphis for a few years. I, I keep saying I lived in Memphis, but actually I lived in, um, in a small town uh, in Covington, Tennessee, about an hour from here. Uh, and when I moved to a small town, my mom was super nervous for me. She said, Drew, be careful. Small towns are known for being racist. And I said, Mom, I'm white. I don't know if I'm on that side of the problem. But I was wrong. I learned if you go to a small enough town, uh, there are people, people that are black, there are people that are white, and then in many small towns, there are people that are just considered not white enough. And that's where I was. <laughs> and then I realized that I've already given the punchline to this joke. I'm gonna do it again, though. We're gonna see how it works. This is, this is a little <laughs> experimental. Can you tell the joke twice? So I ran into this guy, and he's like, Psh, whatever, Taco Bell. I'm like, Domino, you're wrong, I'm Italian. I tried to make up a punchline there to do a different, I'll try to switch it up. But <laughs> here's the joke I meant to do. When I was at a small town, I learned some people love living there and some people absolutely hate it. This guy came up to me first week and he said, hey man, the best part about living in small towns is going to the funerals. And I was like, why? And he's like, whether you believe they're in heaven or not, they're in a better place. <laughs> I know, I was like, oh my gosh. Huh? You guys are great. Um, <laughs> you're like, what's he gonna say next? He's covered so many things. We don't know what to think about this person. Let me ask you this. Um, clap or cheer if you currently have or have ever had a job in retail. <laughs> yep, cool. Let's go ahead and keep that clapping for our, the people at Eggs Up who've taken great care of us. That's it. This has been fun. I love the food here. I know I look like a guy that loves the food anywhere, but I really mean it. I love the food here, it's delicious. Um, so my first job, I was a, a bag boy at Publix. It's a grocery store, I don't know if maybe, but I worked there. And um, let me tell you, uh, I did not like it too much. I started there when I was 16, I was so excited when I uh, quit, and then I had to come back because I started doing stand-up comedy. I had to get my old high school job back. And so I had the same customers I did 10 years ago. And they're like, weren't you here 10 years ago? And I was like, yeah, but I'm making 75 cents more an hour now, so kind of killing it. <laughs> 
thing about Publix was um, I, 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 I really wanted to be good at my job. And I, I, cause I have a problem with people that when they work somewhere that they don't like, they just like take it out on the customer. So my rule is like, I'm gonna be the best cashier even if I hate being here. And that's what I did. So a little thing I did was I learned every single produce code. Like you could say a fruit or vegetable and I'll tell you the code for it. Do you wanna try? <laughs> well, first of all, they had barcode so I didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> do you make great, uh, I was thinking rhubarb too. I was like, they make great pie was what I was about to say, but you don't do that with rutabaga. What else? Banana pepper, 4087. Did you say mangoes or tomatoes? Mangoes, mangoes 4589. Here's the point <laughs> of this joke. Number one, you don't know if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> Two, what I've learned is this is the only practical use for this information now. I can't go up to, like at a job interview and be like, you know, back in the day, ginger root was a tough one to know. 4612. That's why I should be a great lawyer for you. And I certainly couldn't go see a beautiful woman at a bar drinking a blue moon with a little orange slice in it and be like, hey babe, you know the uh, produce code for that orange slice? <laughs> 4012. I'll give you, <laughs> I'll give you some of my digits. Why don't you give me some of yours? <laughs> I knew that line was coming. I was like, they're not gonna like that. <laughs> Have you guys had fun tonight? Yeah. Awesome. Well, this is the first comedy show they've done here. So if you think this is a great idea, let the owners, let the wait staff, let everyone know that this is awesome and they'll do it more. Uh, if you don't think this is fun, um, if you could just do me a favor and lie, that would be <laughs> so nice. Um, but that we have had a lot of fun. Now, um, I'm landing the plane. I'm not done yet. But like you were like, you're like ready your check, please. Let's fit. We're, we're all, but uh, here's one of the things I've learned about being a comedian. Uh, a lot of my friends are comedians and Comedians are terrible friends. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because, so you guys look like a nice friend group. Like maybe before dinner you were having a conversation, you were opening up, you were telling them about your deepest, darkest secrets and your biggest life hurts and all the traumas you're dealing with. And your nice supportive friends are like, oh, I'm, what's your name? Zach. Zach, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, Zach. That's, we're here for you. Let us know if you need anything. But if they were comedians, that's not what they would say. <laughs> You would share all your deepest, darkest secrets and your life traumas, and these fellow comedians would be like, you should totally tell that on stage. <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> no. So this is the one story that all my comedians friends say, you have to tell this on stage. Uh, this was the worst date I've ever been on in my entire life. All right, so it was about 10, 12 years ago. I was back in Nashville. Uh, we went to Zany's Comedy Club to see the comedian. <laughs> Thank, thank you. <laughs> Who, big Zany supporters, love it. Uh, we went to Zany's Comedy Club and we saw the comedian Adam Devine. Has anyone ever heard of Adam Devine? All right, yeah, yeah, that's okay. You're, when I ask questions, you are allowed to respond. I appreciate it. No, yeah, so, so I, was, I was a fan at the time uh, and I should say my date, biggest fan ever. So, so I was like, this is a killer date move, right? So we went and saw Adam Devine. We got a picture with Adam Devine. We're walking back to my car and she stops mid walk and she says, um, Adam Devine just invited me back to his hotel room. So I'm gonna go. Now just so we're clear, eggs up, that is when the date ended. There is no way to recover from that. You came back, oh, can I come? No, okay. But here's the worst part, if this ever happens to you, I wanna prepare you, this is the worst part, is actually the next day when you have to go back to work at Publix. <laughs> and all your friends and customers and everyone on earth is like, how was your big date? And my response was, well, I gave her a night she'll never forget. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, you did. And then I went to the break room and started crying for about two hours, it's fine. <laughs> It was hard because Adam Devine was a, a pretty big hero of mine. Pretty big comedic influence. I'm a big fan of heroes. Uh, I actually love superheroes, if I'm being honest. My, f th thank you. <laughs> yeah, my favorite superhero, since you're asking with your eyes, my favorite superhero uh, was The Flash, right? So he was always, I love the TV show, love comics, whatever. When I was a kid though, my beef with The Flash was like all of his villains were one dimensional, right? For example, his arch nemesis was just this guy named the Reverse Flash. 
And the whole thing about the reverse flash is he used to idolize the flash. He used to want to be the flash. He looked up to the flash and then the flash stole his moment of glory. And in that moment, the reverse flash was like, I want to kill him. Now, when I was a kid, I was like, that's stupid. But then I met Adam Devine. <laughs> and now I think I'm team reverse flash. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, I was doing this routine. At a I hate to break the news, but this isn't the first time I've told these jokes, okay? Um, so I was telling it to a different crowd. Not as cool. Um, and this person came up to me after the show. He's like, hey, uh, you said The Flash was your favorite superhero, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, did you know that Adam Devine voices The Flash in Lego Batman? He stole my girlfriend and superhero, guys. Can I just, can we just take a moment? Now you all seem like a nice table. And you all seem to be giving me the vibes of Drew, this was 12 years ago, get over it. <laughs> and I should, and I wish I could, but little things keep happening in my life. For example, six years ago, I was a youth pastor in Covington, not far from here. It was, it was a Sunday morning, I was teaching my Sunday school class. My kids come in like they do every week. And this one kid's like, hey Drew, have you seen that new TV show, Righteous Gemstones? Oh. I know. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I haven't. Tell me about it. I was like, oh, it's a great show. It makes fun of the church a lot. We really think you'd like it. Uh, we think you'd relate a lot to the youth pastor character. I was like, oh, who plays the youth pastor character? It's like Adam Devine. <laughs> and this one child of God <laughs> had the audacity. I don't think you understand how hard it is for me to be clean in this moment. <laughs> Just, Zach, bear with me. This one child of God had the audacity. Like, yeah, I think he'd be a better youth pastor than you. So I did the most Christian thing I could think of, and I, I kicked him out of church, is what I did. That'll teach him. But here we are in 2024, and my friends, my comedian friends, when they hear this story, they, do, they try. They try to be helpful. They say, Drew, you're looking at this the wrong way. Like, Drew, you're the professional full-time comedian now. It's your, you're performing at places like Eggs Up Grill in Memphis. Kind of killing it. <laughs> Drew, it's your turn to go to a comedy club and go back to your hotel room with someone else's girlfriend. Okay, it's a little hurtful that you all laughed at that part. <laughs> but eggs on the griddle, you're not wrong. That's not my dream, y'all. That's not my goal. That's, I don't think that's me, right? Like, that's just, you gotta be who you are and that's not me. So I don't wanna be the kind of comedian that goes back to his hotel room with someone else's girl, all right? I wanna be the kind of comedian that can afford a hotel room. <laughs> Thank you all, you've been such a great audience. Let's get our host back up here. Let's hear it for Justin Burgess.